My name is Gary Leeming. I'm uh, based at the University of Liverpool, um, previously out Manchester, and I'm the director of the uh, newly formed Civic Data Cooperative, uh, which is working with the Liverpool City region, the Metropolitan uh, District, to look at new ways and uh, models for data governance. Um, just um, I think it's good practice just to say, um, basically, I have dark hair, a beard, um, round glasses, grey top, and behind me is a, a white wall and a, and a, a, a brown um, screen that, that forms um, the, the majority of my, my life. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, um, I am working at the Civic Data Cooperative. I'm currently the only member of staff we are recruiting, um, where our vision is to try and create a new type of uh, data environment and to look at new models of how we um, can um, work with the people who the data are about um, to ensure that we're using it in appropriate ways and with the key objectives of, of looking at how we translate lived experience into insights delivering innovation with impact and uh, testing models for ethical and inclusive use of data and um, the, um, so the the title of this presentation is very much around um, you know how do we um, sort of open up this kind of private personal data uh, for research use um, in a way that, that meets those objectives. Um, so data and privacy. Well, as we know, research data can be sensitive. Um, it can include health information, which can be considered very personal, as well as criminal justice and other personal data under GDPR. Um, we also know that fair does not equal open data so we have to be cautious around you know it, what does that what does how does something be how can something be fair if um it if we can't actually publish the data what does that mean for our research and how do we sort of need to think about that um, and within that context we do need to respect the rights and wishes of the people um, who provide the data who the data are about and for that we need to have infrastructure that's fit for purpose up to this point, you know, you know, to where we think about research, what is research? Um, you know, here we're primarily talking about in silico, where we have some data represented by a database on the left, the set of tools such as Python and R that we use to analyze that data and the researcher. And to make that secure, we put a box around it. We make sure that, you know, that those data can't leave um, without being checked or validated. There are processes in place. So that box represents a set of technical and, uh, and and governance and process driven controls that make it secure. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Gary, what? I can't see any slides. Am I the only one? Oh, you can't see any slides. I, I see your slide. desktop, but not yeah. slides. Oh, right. Okay. Let's try again. I thought that was intentional while you were doing the intro. No, uh, sorry. I'll, uh, oh, that's all right. It's, uh, well, I mean, you know, Shreve had the same problem earlier, so I know it's not just me. Um, let's just try that again. I might have to, um, how can I do that? How can I minimize? Bum, 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 bum. Uh, let's just try this again. It might just because I was switching screens. Let me just try this. I don't, um, sharing screen. What about now? Perfect. Okay, brilliant. Um, my slides aren't that beautiful, so you've not missed that much. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, basically, as we see, we, you know, we've got a box around it. So we've got this, so so this is, and, and I think this lack of clarity has led, led to a com complexity of views about how we manage this from, we have these things called trustworthy research environments and data safe havens and you know they're, they're, they kind of sit together in, in the same space or are they different things and how do they work we've got federated approaches and there are different people working on on that challenges including Becker's has done some great work on this um you know we've got this idea of you know do we take the computer the data or are we allowed you know when are we allowed to take the data out and where do we put it and have we got too many of these things that are coming up um We've got what does anonymization mean? What does pseudonymization mean? And I really never need another conversation on that in my life. And yeah, you know, and but what it really comes down to is, you know, how do we maintain confidentiality and trust uh, for these types of data while also giving it to, you know, making sure that people who need access to it have access to it. 
And a lot of that, I think, comes down to trust. It comes down to explaining why we need that information. Um, and some of the, the other challenges with that are this complex and mixed interpretations of the legislation. Um, you know, the requirements on a, you know, a, an NHS data controller, for example, um, and, and they're thinking, they don't, you know, they're thinking about protecting their trust, their hospital. They don't really necessarily want to or need to understand what you are doing as researchers. So, you know, we have this um, almost clash of, of, of jargon, of meaning and purpose that comes with that. Um, and then, you know, you've got this whole challenge of this environment that we're working in, you know, where, you know, we know that researchers are, for the most part, honourable um, and uh, well-meaning people. Um, but, you know, wrapped around this is are, you know, the people who, pe you know, the, the common, the public, general public generally think about when they think about data, they think about Google or Facebook, people who are grabbing all the data and using it to, to sort of sell things back to them uh, or, or to try and get clicks. Um, and then that leads to a sense of distrust and disempowerment. And it's, and it's not necessarily that people, it can be easy to sort of look at something like um, some of the data leaks and things that have come out about some of the big tech companies and see people's attitudes just being, well, you know, I use Facebook to talk to my friends, so I need to use it, you know, and I'm the same. But it's because we're disempowered. We don't actually have the tools to do anything else. And, and, I, and I think this will affect our ability as researchers to get access to data going forward. Um, and it, I also don't necessarily think it's necessarily about giving people say, hey, you have to consent. To, and what is it they're consenting to? How can it be informed if it's just, well, we just give consent to research or and, and how can we expect compliance if it's, well, we'll give you, we'll ask you every time we want to do a new piece of research. Most people aren't going to click through. So we need to think about that. And finally, there is a problem with digital literacy, especially in areas like Liverpool, where we have um, you know, sort of uh, uh, large areas of you know, deprivation. Um, people might have smartphones. It's easy to look at the stats that say we have, you know, 95% of people, you know, young people today have a smartphone. Do they all, you know, are, are they all, but that doesn't mean that's, there's a big difference between owning a smartphone and being comfortable enough to use it um, uh, in, in, and, and to understand what that means when you do. So lots of challenges. Um, 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 and I think meeting that, I think it's for me, it's a recognition that, you know, it's this old saying, you know, data is the new oil. I don't think it's a new oil anymore, it's probably the old oil. But actually, I think we need to shift our way of thinking about this as a resource that has to be grabbed and think about it as a commons resource, a, 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 something that is, is, a, is a civic um, thing that we own. And the work of Eleanor Ostrom, um, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics on, on this work of the tragedy of the commons, articulated some key design principles that underpin um, how we need to sort of think about commons resources, whether it's a fisheries, whether it's a, a meadow, whether it's, you know, um, a water supply, that mean that, you know, that we, it can be seen as fair and equitable in the way that it, it works. And, and these rules, I think, are, are probably where we need to start thinking about in terms of how, what we get to with the data that we have. And there is a lot of interest in this space. Um, the, the, with, with the materials, I sent out a link to the work that um, the, um, I think, well, in, in, the, in the document, there's links to work by the ODI, um, the uh, Mozilla Foundation, and Ada Lovelace, uh, just this month, published this report on different legal mechanisms for data stewardship, which categorized them in three forms, trusts, cooperatives, and basically just agreeing you know they, um, uh, agreeing contracts that, that put into place what, what it needs to do and I think for today I'm not too concerned about you know whether you favor a trust versus you know a legal contract um, it's more about the principle of sort of saying that actually the people kind of own the data or who the data are about how need to be respected in terms of how we use that data in some way. Um, but I do highly recommend going in and reading some of those reports if you're interested in this space. So the, 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 I'm rattling through a little bit because I want to get to the discussion part and we don't have a lot of time. Um, what I want to talk about is, is, is really is what might a cooperative or a trust um, need to think about in order to be fair? How can, it, how can it support researchers basically while at the same time preserving the privacy of its members? And aligned to that is how can fair meet um, everybody's object, uh, expectations for ethical data management is it is it can it be a key component within it 
we might naturally assume yes, but that's that's something that we can explore. Um, to do this, we're going to use something called the ethical matrix. The ethical matrix was designed to consider different people's opinions in the areas of food and agriculture. But it's, um, I think it, it's a useful, it's just a useful framework for thinking about um, the impact or, or how the benefits of using certain technologies or using the data and how that might align to people's desires or expectations about what's good for them or what's good for society. So we want to really to split this up into three sort of areas. Well-being, so is, is this good for, you know, how is this good for me? Um, autonomy, you know, what, what, how does this empower me and how does it help to empower others? And fairness, how does it make society more equitable? Um, and the, those three things are, are obviously explored in more detail in the literature as to why those three things in, in the literature on ethical matrix work and this is the link to one there as well. Uh, the, obviously, as you know, there's a Google slide, so you can see them. So in order to sort of answer those questions, um, I, I sort of I set up a, a mural board at this link. Now, when I click on it, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. Do, has my screen disappeared again or can you see a mural? No, it's the same, just the slides. Okay, great. I'll stop sharing and I'll reshare. Um, so if, if you can go to that link, the bit.ly link that's in the chat, um, it, you don't need an account. Uh, you don't need to put your name in, just click straight through. Um, Mural is not the, it's not my favorite tool in some ways, but it's useful for things like this. And to use Mural just very quickly while, we, while you're having a bit of a play and look around it, anywhere on the screen, if you just double click, you will get a post-it note um, and then you can type in uh, something from that now. Uh, am I showing that now? If you want to just go to straight to the screen, it's like uh, Google Docs, everybody's kind of sharing it. And as you can see, we've I've created a, a bit of a framework here uh, based on the well-being, autonomy and fairness. Um, and I haven't locked it, so you might accidentally move things around. Don't worry about that. Um, I might just quickly lock it in a second. Um, what I've done is just put in some examples. So across the end is who are the stakeholders so for the nhs for say clinicians you know what do they what would they get out of of fair um so i've just put here as an example you know maybe an increase in trust in research software they might know that it's you know that it's it's better uh it's been tested that they can go and look at it themselves uh, and, and read and understand the literature and while they may not do those things i think it's it's, it's uh, obviously good that they can in terms of autonomy, uh, acknowledging the role uh, of, of doctors in collecting that data, you know, recognizing that they are a key part of that actually I think is, is an important thing. And that's something that FAIR does. It, it, gives, it gives the same, you know, it gives greater prominence to the data than uh, it is traditionally done in research. So recognizing that patients and doctors have a, a role to play in this is important. And fairness, you know, um, maybe gives people an opportunity to participate in research and, and to make things more equal, um, you know, in, in terms of equality of opportunity. And similarly with service users, I just put some in, so it's so patients, um, you know, for well-being, maybe they get access to better research because of this. We, you know, we think this is going to improve the way research is done. The data trust could act on, you know, the will of the majority of the group. So it gives patients greater power over um, how their data are used. And finally, around fairness, you know, they have a better understanding about how their rights are being protected as well. That might be something that we can do. So I think what I'd probably like to do is on the bottom one, if everybody can just sort of come down to the, to the researchers row. I don't know whether I've done this too big or too small for people. Um, I think if we could just spend, if you could just spend a couple of minutes perhaps focused on uh, well-being for, for researchers. Um, I, if um, you just want to sort of have a think about, you know, where can I could, you know where where could or how could a co-op help you as a researcher um it's probably the, the, the sort of summary of this question what what would it need to do in order to be valuable to you or something that you would consider using if you have any questions um if that doesn't make sense um just put your hand up and we'll we'll uh, unmute you
and in a minute I will just um, have a look through and maybe we can start to move on to the next one. So we've got things um, greater access to the right data. That's uh, an interesting one. Um, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about what, what right means in that context. Is that just better quality data or appropriate data? Is that something else? I put that one in, I can say, I, I was thinking the data that you actually want for whatever research question you're, you're asking. Um, so for example, if you were doing a study on, on gender or something like that, you could find the data sets which contain the actual information you're looking for. Okay, so so greater visibility of the content, even if you can't uh, uh, um, get see the data at the, for, at the start, at least you understand more about what's what's in there in order yeah. to have designing questions. Um, and I guess you know that that's it. Um, a few comments on on reproducibility as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean that's that's a, that's a really big topic. Um, confidence that data is used ethical. Yeah, we hope so. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's. I mean, we've all got our own kind of ethics, like approval processes at various organisations. But I think a lot of these newer models, they're a lot more deliberate about how they engage. You know the the people whose data it is. Um, mm. you know, I think the NHS actually doesn't do too badly at that with its public patient um, engagement sort of model, but it's sort of, I think, it's just sort of more visibility and more confidence of kind of what, you know, that the people have been making, you know, the people whose data has been used are, are benefiting, you know, having a, the right benefit from it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's um, a really interesting point. Um, and it's almost, it, the, you know, the data almost comes pre-approved, I guess, in that way, as it were. Yeah, and, and I think it can like help in the other direction as well. So like, um, we bumped in a few times into maybe over-restrictive reliance on narrow consent for, um, for sort of trial data and the, you know, I think you mentioned in your in your sort of intro, if you have to go back to individuals every time, you're just going to get this huge drop off in the ability to reuse that. Yeah. So I think that's particularly the data trust model kind of really, I think is really attractive there. If it, then you make a decision, folk can make a decision to sort of trust a collective to to kind of um, gatekeep. The use of their data in the in the future and therefore be confident it's not just going to get handed over to google but also you know know that it won't just sit in a, a box somewhere and never get reused yeah yeah, yeah. there's a, an entity in a sense promoting that this data is here please use it as well as is actually as a part of that isn't it oh yeah yeah, yeah. uh i guess think about it because um yeah um so let's move on to autonomy and i don't know how easy this one people are going to find this so i'm interested to see um but this is about um so how, how do you feel it would sort of help you with um so effectively you know how, how does it i guess to some extent empower you or others to 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 do research and where, where can that meet
So uh, and please continue to keep, to, to keep adding some if, if, you, if, you, if you have any ideas. Um, so easier to collaborate, to, to persuade your collaborators to work with fair data when others are doing it too. Yes, that's, that's um, um, I think that is true. Um, one of the one of the things that I really enjoy about working, well, being part of the SSI, is that um, health data is really locked down and really restricted. And then you sort of meet people from a discipline like astronomy, where everything's preprint, everything's published, everything's you know sort of maybe embargoed for a very short period of time and then out there. And and sort of seeing, and, so, and I'm starting to see that actually come into. I think COVID has pushed a lot of that thinking actually into health research and care research. Now I'm seeing much more collaborative ways of thinking uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to thrive. Um, certainly with the ISRIC project that I've been interested in, you know, we've really tried to push that, but we haven't also haven't had a lot of resource for it as well and, and how we fund it. So I think there is a, some, some challenges there about how we fund and support FAIR, um, maybe from a, from a sort of the perspective of, of something like this, um, cooperative and how we could do that. Um, fantastic. Um, and again, as I said, I'm, it, it's unfortunately these things are, are very short, um, uh, but I think if we can sort of move to fairness and, you know, sort of equality and how, how you sort of see that um, as, as being useful for you, that would be really helpful. Um, so if, if people have things to add there, please go for it. Um, yeah, so lots of collaboration. Um, more in control of processes. So moving on to fairness, um, make research outcomes more sustainable and generalizable. more usable um, for researchers in low resource settings. Yeah. Um, same access to data. So, so the, the the low resource setting one then is that is that um, what, what I, uh, again I guess just from my own experience um, I, I remember attending a, a session where we were um, sort of part of a hat day type type thing with with people from around uh, the university that I was working with at the time and um, you know there, there was a huge disparity of people like social scientists and uh, the humanities. Um, you know, the, the funding pots that they have and that they work with are so much smaller than the ones that we were sort of expecting. Is that, you know, it, it, if we can lower that barrier, if you feel like at the cost of entry to health data, do, you know, what does that, is people's feeling that, what does that sort of open us to? I mean, I added that one and I was, I think you're not wrong, Ben, I was thinking more of um, researchers in developing countries or independent researchers who don't have access to any institutional funding. Yeah, I, I mean, access to health data actually is an interesting one when it comes to that, because often we're not allowed to take it out of outside of countries. Um, and, you know, if you're working with China, say, or Japan, you know, they can't send you their data and we can't send them our data it becomes part of the issue. But yeah, I mean, certainly I think building those kinds of models that help it comes out to some extent down, down to reuse and having the same thing in different places. So if the, if the cost of entry is lower, um, you know, can we stand something up in you know, Malawi or um, you know wherever um, in, in order to do that? Um, I think it's the kind of reuse of the or the um, sort of embedding of the kind of things you have to do to access data. Like there's a, I think the easiest way to access data is to also be a clinician, uh, you know, for health data. And then the second easiest way is to have good relationships with the clinician. And then the further you get away from that, the, you know, the more you get into 
know, has your institution or your research group done work with you know, this particular trust before, for example? Um, and it feels we haven't, there's just so almost every, to, to, to greater or less extent, every time you go to access a new data set or access a data set from a new partner, you're having to go through that process that not much less time cost than the first people who, who, who went through that. We, we don't seem to have communalized kind of the benefit of, of having worked through this several times in the past. You know, you know, the, you know, the pain that other organizations have been through, you know, that benefit hasn't been banked for the organizations that follow. That's one of my big frustrations. So it's not just health data. I, mean, you know, I think it you know, so, it's so, for like financial data and other. So how, how how do we overcome that then? If that's I mean, if it is a common problem, is it is it just one of those things that's just intrinsic, or how how could we I mean, how do and and that is a big barrier to fairness in in lots of ways in terms of you know the, the sharing of the outcomes. I mean, one of the things, for example, you know Liverpool, you know one third of people living below the poverty line, um, it, it's you know and yet research funding and the use of data from Liverpool in research is probably significantly lower. Um, than that in other areas. So, yeah, I think there's been, you know, sort of maybe leaning more on the technical end, there's been some you know, recent discussions under the HR UK kind of auspice around, you know, sort of cross crediting some of these trusted search environments. And I think for some data holders, if you, you know, agree to do your work in like, I forget what the general version of Salia for Welsh is, it's SERP. The, the kind of Welsh national uh, secure research environment, then you, it's relatively easy for some data providers to access their data that they've already got there. And even though from a like legal perspective, the researcher is still wearing the data controller hat, which seems to be kind of like all the long way around. But um, yeah, so there's like, depending on kind of, yeah, there's these bits that depending on kind of who you are and what, other parts of the system you use, some bits can become surprisingly easy, and then other bits can just be sort of super, super hard. Um, so yeah, I think I think just turning some of this into common standards for things. You know what? You know, what training? Well, when we say researchers need to have good you know, data protection training, what, what what do we mean? You know, when we say an environment needs to provide you know certain protection against data, sort of what do we mean? You know, um, when we work then maybe some of that is tackling really gnarly things like I know you've been when I talk about pseudonymization and anonymization of the but like that I, it's it's quite telling to me that they were both mentioned in the same sort of um national data guardian report but there's a there is clear guidance I think it's through and it was digital maybe but about publishing aggregate data and the equivalent kind of publishing or well, not publishing but um rules for kind of anonymizing uh, individual level data to go into secure research environments has never seen the light of day. Yeah. Uh, I was chatting over coffee at some uh, workshop to someone who was involved in a go at that and uh, definitely seemed to have some, some like, uh, like shell shock from that experience. So, it's, so some of these might be hard problems, but like we're solving them in a very ad hoc basis, very collectively expensively at the moment yeah. to get the access that we do have. And we could probably solve them somewhat cheaper in a way that would mean that there's loads of projects that currently aren't happening that could happen because they can take advantage of that or we'd stop spending 18 months getting access to data and start spending you no know, weeks or, or a couple of months i think it's a bit like trial design isn't it i'm sorry I am oh yeah 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 it is yeah, yeah. We, we, with different you know, we use different trial design models for, for, for different things because of you know the different circumstances and that's the research questions we have we need to start thinking about this the same way. And in some cases, you know, federated, federated querying of data sets, it's like, you know, using um, sort of data shield type approach versus the TRE is probably going to be more appropriate, uh, et cetera. And, and actually being, you know, maybe, maybe that's a space that we do need to think about then is, is how we sort of categorize them. So um, I'm question that we are at time. And does anybody have any last things, burning things they want to say? Um, I'm very happy to give the platform to anybody who does. I was just going to just follow up from something that Martin said that um, reminded me of something, which was that I think that um, certainly within the health research domain, there's a lot of suspic suspicion around using open source software or open source solutions. And I think 
um, there's uh, there's kind of like this um, issue around, you know, like, well, who takes liability if something goes wrong, which is why people prefer to pay for a hosted solution or to pay for some ridiculously expensive license uh, in order to then, you know, say, well, this has gone wrong, so you now have to fix it. Um, but then at the same time, I think that um, we have some amazing technological solutions to all of these problems, but uh, which are available and they're used in, within the health domain or outside the health domain. And for just some reason, they're just not adopted uh, for one reason, reason or another with the health position. So I feel like um, I, we need a way of convincing, I guess, the data controllers that are, there are much wider options and opportunities out there of how we can solve these sort of data problems, data governance problems or data governance issues and, and give researchers that need or people that need the access to the data, the access to the data a lot quicker. Yeah. So I think we might be missing kind of regulatory or, or um, you know, compliance safe havens, if you know what I mean, like that. Uh, I think a lot of the people with the responsibility for the data kind of being kept safe feel super scared about any of the decisions that they make and that certain options, you know, like effectively outsourcing the risk, you know, by either allowing someone else to take on the data controller role or by, um, you know, buying a commercial service with a load of penalty clauses, that sort of feels like something that gives them, like it's it's a kind of nobody got fired for buying IBM sort of model, you know, these are, these are sort of risk mitigation actions that so it kind of seem to be in the playbook of if someone comes and there's a problem, I can say, hey, I did, I did my due diligence here, and 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 yet ultimately, you can't outsource that responsibility. You're still it still is your responsibility, but somehow, you know, doing that in a in a more yeah, there's there's just that, but that doesn't seem to spread out to like like you say either running your own open source thing or partnering up with a you know a research organization. I want to come back to you on that. So if we can just keep the call open just for a couple of minutes and everybody's, whoever wants to stay, more than welcome to. But just to say thank you to everybody. I hope it was um, useful to you. And um, please feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any further questions about what we're doing or interest in any of the topics that we've discussed today. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, Martin, the thing I was going to say actually is the what's interesting there is the choring, the work that you did on, on the classification scheme yeah, yeah. and I still use that although I've moved down to Liverpool I'm still using that to try and convince my uh, data access local data access group not it's how, how do I teach so how to stop you know how I learn to stop worrying and, and love the bomb type thing you know it's like how, how you know if you apply your your schema to NHS digital right you would not need the majority of data that comes out of NHS digital does not need to sit in the TRE because the, the chances of re-identifying somebody from it is really low. The chances of somebody wanting to re-identify it is really low. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we, over, we are over-egging the risk on this. And from that, now building this whole industry of secure data platforms, so which just so makes so everybody's cool. life even harder, because now not only do you have to go through six months of pain with NHS Digital, you have to go through six months of pain getting access to a TRE. Yeah, I, I, I think I'll tell you something that super surprised me. We did a piece of work with health data, you know, uh, you know, well pseudonymized health data um, over the last year. And I thought getting ethics approval would take a long time. It was super quick. It was quicker than everything else, <laughs> like any other step in the process. I was really surprised by that. Um, but the, then actually operationalizing that permission to, to use the data was extremely painful, even with extreme willing on all sides. And something that I found really interesting is, I don't know how common this is across the NHS, but certainly in this collaboration, it came from the NHS side, that we're referring to this sort of five safes model that came out of the national statistics kind of yeah. um, sort of sector. And in that paper, they talk about sort of these controls being, you know, like how safe are your people? You know, are they well-trained? Do they sign the right contracts and so on? How safe is your environment? You know the place you like the trusted research environment. Uh, you know how safe is the project? You know the research, the question you're doing. How safe is your data? How safe are your outputs? And it feels we've got this very strong thing on outputs. You know when it comes to summary data, you know small cell counts, suppress those, a lot of classical statistical disclosure control. And then there's like an over reliance on safe data. I think 
because I think actually a lot of the data, like you say, Gary, is actually quite safe. But also, the more you the more you make data less identifiable, the kind of less valuable it is. And in the original paper, they talk about data being the residual control. You decide kind of what controls you can have on the other ones because they're non-destructive. And then you put just enough data kind of control in to, to, to match into that. And my experience has been when it comes to health data, you either have someone who's like a bit overly missive in sharing, or at the other extreme, you get, you know, a trust who wants you to apply the same controls to the same rest of the dials, you know, the same secure environment, the same accreditations of people and, and systems as you would if you were running like an in the clear public, you know, health records accessing the real data versus strongly, you know, de-identified or, or, you know, sort of otherwise kind of made, made safer. And, and I find that really fascinating and frustrating. And I think it does come down to this thing though. So, so in GDPR, like in the latest version, they, it, 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 it's, I think it makes it hard to, to say what's, like it's most pseudonymized data ends up being personal data under the GDPR. And yet most pseudonymized data, if done remotely well, um, is impossible to notify the subject of the breach on the GDPR because as the data processor or data controller, you can't identify because you've made deliberate efforts to make it hard to re-identify. And that seems to be a very perverse situation to be in. And I, and I was quite pleased to see uh, uh, at the ICO say that they're having another go at updating their um, anonymization guidance. Uh, and I um, and there's an opportunity for, for us to feed into that. So I think we should take that opportunity because um, for a while it looked like they were going in the right direction. There's all this motivated intruder stuff which seems to have gone from sort of the latest, at least sort of annotated version of the legislation. And yeah, I think you're right. There's, there's this, like our, um, our, our, our sort of like ability to demonstrate or inject confidence in the level of kind of de-identification or de-risking we've done to the data is, 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 is just sort of like really low for some reason. And, I, and I, I just can't work out. And I feel that's something that NHSX or NHS Digital, you know, some central like strong guidance, you know, from core NHS, if we can sort of persuade them at the center, you know, they can somehow modulate the expectations that they're pushing down because I, I forget what the legislation is, but there's two competing bits. They've got GDPR and they've got some national information security kind of requirement and some duty of confidentiality. That, like it seems there's multiple bits of legislation that are kind of pushing them in the same direction. But yeah, I like, but yeah, I guess I'm mostly persuaded about the same things and strongly agreeing with you there. Yeah, yeah. well, Someday we'll have a coffee in person again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, we're having exactly the same conversations at the moment about synthetic data, um, and um, you know whether the data sets or the, the synthetic data generators, you know, are private enough. Uh, and in lots of cases, like it's really hard to, you know, it's, it's, it's like having those same conversations, but with. Uh, sort of privacy enhancing approaches that are less explainable to the people who hold the data and it's just exactly the same yeah, yeah. and we, we, we we're going to miss the prize giving if we uh <laughs> stay too long although i don't think i'm winning any prizes we uh, but uh, it's probably time to move on um again thank you everybody um details are in the doc please do reach out if people are interested and i'm sure martin will Host the host the Zoom to oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thanks everybody.